Okay, here's Hugh Harford Thompson. Um, thank you, Hugh, for joining us. Um, I met uh, Hugh in London, um, where he showed me uh, his solution. Um, Hugh is a VP product for MineHub. It was an originally Canadian company, but uh, with a lot of their activities in UK. So Hugh is joining us from London. Um, so I saw a little bit of uh, MineHub, you know, uh, in action um, when I when I visited in London, uh, and uh, then it was quiet for a while. And then the, this summer there was a big announcement that BHP and Bauer Steel of China. Uh, have completed the iron ore sale uh, using the MineHub platform. So that was an amazing news, and uh, we'll be delighted to hear what else is new with MineHub. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, I think, Tanya, you need to allow me to share my screen. It says somebody's already sharing. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, I probably Annika needs to stop sharing. Uh, okay, um, give me a sec. Annika is not a presenter anymore. You should be able to share. It's uh, where there are two. Uh... Yeah, it says somebody is already sharing their screen. Oh. Okay. Do, 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 do. See. Okay, it's, it's working now. I think. Yeah. Oh okay. yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think. Uh... Is that working? Um, oh, nothing yet, different. but uh, it takes a little a moment. Do you see it? Everything's just. Mm. Oh, 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 we lost him as a presenter. That's not good. <laughs> um. Oh, I think I think uh, Hugh must have been uh, thrown out uh, the conference. Maybe connections issue, not uh, not a tragedy. I do have his full um, um, his full presentation in case it does not work. Uh, but hopefully we will have him alive. No, don't see him yet. Um, after after this, this is our last presentation of the day. We will have a, a short Q and A session with a well a panel expert panel. I see. Tony has joined us. Annika stayed with us. Thank you. Um, I don't know who else. Okay. Uh, okay. All right. You, please. Yeah, a presenter. Um, and we have a number of questions. There will be a number of recommendations, hopefully. Okay. Here Let's we can see you again. again. Yeah. Okay. Something is happening. Yeah, we see your screen now. My screen, perfect. So you should okay. now see the full screen. Is that correct? Yep, that looks good. Okay, Fantastic. I'm turning off and you go ahead. Apologies for the uh, technical issues. Um, so good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, um, depending where you're dialing in from, I suppose. Um, uh, thanks for the introduction, Tanya. I'm Hugh Halford Thompson, VP of product here at MineHub. Um, we, are, we are still a Canadian company. Um, but yeah, as you say, we have operations, uh, most of the team here in Europe, um, but also out in Vancouver, out in Shanghai. Uh, we do a lot of work in Singapore um, and a few other places. Um, MineHub is a platform business um, where we are fundamentally transforming the way that transactions in the mineral supply chains are operated. Um, if I go to my next slide. Not working. This will work. Okay. There we go. Um, so you should now be able to see my next slide. Please tell me if you can't, Tanya. Um, but yeah, although the company was formed in 2018, for me, um, it's it's actually a continuation of work I started in 2015 in my previous company. Um, there I led a, a project with Visa initially, um, the card company and six major banks. And we were looking at how the, the then brand new blockchain technology could help create a smoother interbank communication and settlement process. Um, that was a fairly that was fairly early on in the technology. Um, uh, I did a, a, another project in 2017 uh, where I led a cross industry initiative called One Office, 
where we were focused on realizing paperless settlement in pipeline gas trades, uh, initially in Europe and then in the US, again, using uh, blockchain technology. Um, and there I was working with a group of nine of the top 12 gas traders in Europe, um, including a, a couple of the oil majors, um, in fact, several oil majors, um, to transform the way post-trade settlement was, is conducted. Now, at MineHub, we are still a nimble startup, um, but we're working with some of the largest companies in the mining industry, uh, dealing with post-trade settlement of uh, mining and metals. Um, and really validating uh, with some of the largest companies in the industry, validating and refining our, our value proposition with them. And what I find really interesting is the number of similarities that MineHub has with these two other projects. Uh, they're projects in completely different industries. They're projects that, ser that solve uh, fundamentally different issues. Um, but it's not just MineHub and the work I did with One Office and Visa. It's it's actually uh, MineHub and a lot of other projects in a in a huge number of industries um, uh, where blockchain technology is enabling new ways of doing business. Um, so today I want to talk to you about how enterprise systems have evolved over the years, um, how the convergence of different technologies of blockchains, containerization. Uh, infrastructure as a service and other technologies can now start to unlock transformation and automation at an industry level rather than a company level, um, as well as how this applies in the metals and mining world. So as, as you, uh, a lot of you probably know, um, uh, about 75% of global GDP is generated in supply chains. You've got about $2 trillion of metals and minerals moving around the world every year. And you've got thousands of companies interacting with each other um, along these well-established but actually ever-changing supply chains. So with multiple companies coming together for uh, each trade, this industry is, is very well placed to leverage um, the, the benefits of a common communication layer across all the participants. Um, so I'll go a little bit into what I mean with that. but. Uh, if you look at the the pressures on the uh, on the industry, like other natural resources, the supply chains are under constant pressure from multiple angles. Um, you've got the cost of compliance increasing. Uh, it's not just sanctions and KYC, but also compliance with ESG regulations and other rules. Um, you've got capital retreating. Uh, there's recent fraud cases, especially out in Singapore at the start of this year. Um, and other defaults have been accelerating. So the withdrawal of commodity banks uh, from transactional finance has been accelerating. And then you've got obviously the geopolitical stress and the global pandemic, which has uh, exposed a lot of fault lines in the resilience of these supply chains. Now, these 21st century pressures are always uh, challenging to deal with but if you look at the setup that we have in the uh in, in the commodities industry in general it's really a, a 17th century way of working we have a lot of paper heavy manual processes that bury the information that we need to deal with the challenges um and uh we need we need a new solution we need something more modern so to understand how new technology how blockchain how other technologies can help it really helps to understand why we got to where we are today. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time on, on this slide and then a, a similar one to show how this evolves. Um, but if you think back to uh, the good old days before the internet, um, before global communications were, were revolutionized like this, um, a typical company would be organized something like what we see on the left here. Um, so you've got hierarchical structures, you've got departments reporting up to other departments, reporting to regions, reporting to head office. Um, and, and there's a lot of different ways to set that up, obviously, but the delay in the communications, especially across countries and continents, could take weeks because of the ancient method that everybody used for, for moving paper around the world, the, the postal service. Um, so obviously things have changed a little bit now, but the gentle pace that communications would flow would always mean that decisions would, would be made based on data that was often out of date. Um, and about 30 years ago, um, also somewhere between 30 and 50 years ago, um, IBM, Oracle, SAP, uh, open source ones like MySQL and all sorts of other software giants 
came in and slowly but surely persuaded, or, um, and, and with good reason, uh, almost every company in the world to convert to the system on the right. So you'll have seen, um, a, a lot of you will have heard this pitch from, from various companies going years back. Um, the idea is to get all departments working across, uh, uh, across your organization, working off a common set of data. So the idea is simple, you break down silos, you make the data accessible, transparent, synchronized, creating a single source of truth across your entire organization. Now, over time, some companies have made a right mess of this, um, but for the most part, they've sorted it out to a, you know, to a reasonable level, some better than others. Um, and some enterprises have literally spent billions of dollars on integrated IT solutions. Um, again, some successfully, some, some failed, but um, when they work, they work great internally. But as soon as you apply this to supply chains, it can really fall apart. You no longer have one source of truth. You have one source of truth in each department of each company, uh, or at least each company that is involved in the transaction. Um, so if we look at a, <coughs> Uh, if we look at an example settlement of a transaction, and I, I think this is of a copper trade, this one uh, between Kenya and the Netherlands, you've got 30 organizations, you've got about 100 people um, doing 200 interactions over, over the course of a month. Um, and a lot of the time that is spent is waiting for, uh, the effort is spent getting everybody in sync and the time is waiting for the paperwork. Um, so, <coughs> These transactions concern the, the sale and purchase of high value goods. You've got a lot of parties involved in logistics, finance, risk management, other services that are required to deliver the goods to the buyer and importantly secure the payment. Um, now this post-trade transaction process is in that essence, it's, it's information dense, it's a complex workflow, um, it's across several involved companies um, and several departments within those companies with multiple risk transfers going between them all. Now, due to the complexity and the multi-party and uh, company and department nature of the workflow, there's no central coordination mechanism. There's no common view of the status. So instead, coordination still relies on bilateral calls, bilateral document flows being sent between the parties um, uh, where each company is attempting to coordinate uh, and to compare notes with everybody else. So you can imagine if there's seven people in, uh, seven companies involved, you've got a coordinator from each company who's chasing up with everybody else saying, what's the status, what's the status, what's the status of all the different parts of the transaction. Um, so email and chat have sped things up, but uh, it's also actually increased the risk and complexity because you've now got multiple versions of information that need to be reconciled and checked across multiple channels, across multiple companies. And quite often you'll get one company updated with information, somebody else is not, and synchronizing across all these channels becomes uh, very difficult. Now, if we take the image that I had on the, uh, on the previous slide and let it evolve slightly, what we had on, on the right before was a, a, a nice clean uh, IT system and uh, it's now, it, it works so well within an organization, it feeds all its departments with up-to-date information. Um, but as soon as you go down uh, and integrate this with a variety of trading partners, this drops uh, for the most part to the lowest common denominators um, and transactions are still settled with paper, emails and phone calls. Now you do have um, uh, EDI connections and direct API connections between some companies. Um, and I saw some questions about that earlier. But generally, when you have a, a transaction coming together in, in, in this industry, um, you've got the buyer, you've got the seller, you've got the inspectors, the insurers, the ports, the different uh, banks involved um, and everybody else. And it's not always the same parties coming together. So until you integrate them all, you still have this issue. Um, <clears throat> and it's, it's not just mining, it's not even just commodities. Every industry with complex supply chains with multiple parties involved um, has this issue. But in mining, um, the, the number of parties involved makes this exponentially worse. Um, and the ever evolving uh, nature of the groups of parties coming together for a transaction. So 
if you look on the on the right here, um, if you have a common platform connecting everybody together, obviously you'll get a massive efficiency gain. You can you can establish standards, you can have new apps and services built on on, uh, on top of this and connecting to these platforms. And was what what was once an unreliable mess can start being codified and automated. Now, codifying it or automating it is really important because once you get uh, something automated and once you can rely on the data to a point where you know that if you have the data, this is definitely the latest copy, then you can start building internal services uh, uh, or other services on top of that. Um, and you can start uh, focusing on higher value items. Um, so this has already happened in, in, in a lot of industries where you've got high frequency trading. Um, if you want to trade super fast, um, then uh, what's happened is a central data holder has effectively been forced into the industry, often created by the, the industry members, um, but they're not wanted entirely. So there's a sacrifice that's being made there where um, they, you know, everybody knows that they're creating a monopoly, um, uh, but at the same time, they need to be able to trade that quickly, so they're going to do it. Um, now, in lower frequency environments, uh, trading environments like metals, like commodities, there's no uh, central repositories like this. The, those pressures haven't been big enough to overcome the, uh, the want to not have a monopoly. Um, now, with blockchain technology, with containerization, infrastructure as a service, um, all of this converging, you can actually change this model in, in, in all sorts of industries. Um, and you can enable data creators to remain in control. Um, they own their data, they control what's done with it, rather than handing it over to a central entity. And, and importantly, what I mean by that is not that you have a, a contract with a central entity that defines how the data is controlled and they're closely regulated and trusted. It's actually that you control it in your own environment. And even if the contract was all ripped up, the you know, that central party doesn't have access at all. Um, now, if you combine these technologies um, and deploy it in the right way, you can get that next generation connectivity that you want, and you can enable the benefits of automation and reliability that you get from a central um, uh, system like SAP, Oracle, um, whatever system you want as your central database within your company. Um, but you can deliver those benefits across an entire industry and integrate with all your peers uh, using that. So if I look at, um, uh, if, if I look at this technology, um, the, 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 some of the advances it can give, you can get a coordination service for the settlement of a transaction that's always based on shared real-time information. And using that, we can start tackling the inefficiency, the lack of transparency, the vulnerabilities in the processes. Um, and uh, this is what we've been doing at MineHub. Um, for, uh, with MineHub, we allow parties that are involved in the transaction to effectively create and use a common source of truth, which is then continuously updated as the transaction progresses. Um, and then this in turn creates, uh, sorry, integrates with the operations teams and the processes uh, of the companies uh, of all the different departments in these different companies, uh, integrates them into a common workflow, which is coordinated by our platform. Now that uh, our platform then effectively becomes a tireless sort of 24 seven digital transaction manager or transaction coordinator and make sure that everybody is up to date. Everybody knows the latest uh, copy of the data, uh, but also knows the status of the transaction and knows what they need to do and when. Um, so this isn't unlike ERP, um, but rather than doing that within in enterprise, we're now applying this at a whole industry level. Now, visibility between companies is obviously uh, very commercially sensitive. Um, so for anyone doing this, it should be no surprise that uh, one of the biggest issues that they will face is uh, biggest challenges is around data privacy, data security and data governance um, and residency as well. Um, and you really have to ensure, I've, I've said this already, but that the data owners are in full control with the data on their servers, uh, if they so wish. Um, and then they've got full control of access, uh, resident security, everything around that. So they shouldn't be handing over trust to a central party for that. For, for MineHub, 
we, uh, you know, smaller companies may not want to host it, so we can host for them. Um, but for companies uh, that want to do it themselves, we won't have access to the data and we don't want it. Um, the data must be held within the client's own environment. So in the mining industry, um, these uh, on, the, uh, on the slide here are some of the areas that I see being affected first. <clears throat> it covers a lot of departments and a lot of companies. Um, and uh, I mean, that should be no, no surprise because blockchain technology is effectively a new communication tool. Um, and as each of these processes gets integrated, you'll start to see a wealth of services that start being built on top of it. Some will be small, um, but with profound impacts, like the ability to create an index feed as a set of peers rather than for a central provider. Um, and there's obviously a lot of challenges around that, but uh, there's a lot of people in different industries and different companies uh, starting, to, starting to do that. Um, others could impact the way companies market to each other. Um, or when they choose to share information, um, others still are impossible to predict. So at, at this point, and you, you'll start to see app stores appear on top of these different platforms. Um, we're building one on top of MindHub and you'll get a wide range of services um, that come in once the core data in a, in a transaction can be really relied upon. Um, so from my side, from my background, I'm, I'm not making this up. Um, I'm working on a daily basis uh, with some of the largest companies in the industry, validating new solutions and collaborating with them. Um, the work we do at MineHub includes uh, a number of companies that are number one in their industry on the left here, um, like the work uh, that you mentioned, Tanya, um, that we're doing with BHP and China Bao. Um, but we also work with other major companies uh, as well as SMEs, uh, some of which are described on the right here. Um, and that comes to the end of my talk. So thank you very much. And uh, yeah, if you would like to get in, in touch, uh, please call or email me. Uh, my contact details are on the slide here. Um, I'm on UK time zone uh, for anyone calling. Um, but uh, yeah, thank you very much. And please fire away with questions. I'll try and find the question box. Okay. I see here a question that comes, I think, from Tony, uh, our speaker. <laughs> How do you manage the conflict between the need to standardize an operational process versus the actual physical diversity of operational assets on the ground? So we are um, we're focused on the exchange of information between the different parties. So. If you take, um, if you look at the operations within a company or within uh, within a mine, um, for us that's just internal data. Um, so we're not uh, we're, we're not dealing with that so much. We actually do have some companies, um, especially some of the smaller companies we work with, who are starting to manage their inventory um, uh, on Mine Hub, starting to use us a little bit as an ERP solution. Um, but we're not uh, we're not intending to go too far there. Um, the idea for us is when you want to share that inventory, when you want to share your transaction agreement, um, when you want to share um, uh, documents and data with your buyers, with your banks, your insurers, um, whoever it is, then you can expose that through MineHub. Now, the, uh, the, the different types of products will have different quality assessments uh, that assayers need to do, for example. So each company can, can define their products and define what's being measured within that. Um, now, that's something that, that works great. You make it all custom, but then on the other side, you need to standardize. Um, so uh, what we're doing is saying, well, we, we want to make sure that if somebody is measuring um, copper, um, uh, it's, it's CU. Um, spelt the same way. It's not translated. Um, I can't think of other examples in different languages, but um, you know, chlorine wouldn't be chlor in French, for example. We'd make sure in the back end it's all stored in, in the same standard way. So we're we're making uh, some of our data will be a, a sort of global static data that we share with everyone. And if you want to add uh, a new type of element that, or compound that you're measuring, or if you want to add a new country to the list of countries, 
um, you effectively feed that in through us. We'll check that there's no uh, double entry um, that you can already use, um, and then we'll, we'll add it straight in. So that, that helps to standardize. Um, but it's a, it's a soft, um, you know, we want to push for standardization, but it's a soft push in that if somebody wants to put a custom agreement in, like we can say, well, this is what most people use for, for copper concentrates. This is what most people use for Arnor. Um, but if you need your own fields, go ahead and, and change it. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, we need to hurry up now to move on to our very brief uh, expert panel. Uh, so um, we just have a few questions we will be able to run through quickly before we need to say goodbye to everybody and, and until the next time, which I will say again, it is October 27th. I will send invites to everybody who registered for this event. Um, I want to compliment our speakers. We had a very good audience retention. We hardly lost anybody who joined from the very beginning. Um, so yeah, Gustavo, do you want to uh, ask the first question? Hey, Gustavo. <laughs> I don't hear him, so I'll have to ask the first question myself because I'm actually the person answering it anyway. Um, so the first question that I had in, in my list is, tell us an inspiring blockchain story. And uh, I, I'm going to uh, answer it. Uh, I heard an inspiring blockchain story in about June, I think it was. And it was from IBM, one of their webinars, where they described how in two weeks they established a blockchain solution for providing of personal protective equipment to the New York, New York hospitals. Um, in, the, in the beginning of the pandemic, uh, there was a great uh, difficulty with obtaining this personal protective equipment because it is a highly regulated industry and the hospitals just didn't know who can supply, who has uh, the stock to supply them and, and whether these pe people are legitimate. And uh, so this blockchain solution was devised and implemented within two weeks. It took the suppliers from in, inside the US only one day to get registered on the blockchain. So they were verified. They had somebody to come and check out whether they are you know, a proper supplier. And uh, after that, uh, they could uh, put their stock on the blockchain to make the hospitals aware of what they have. Uh, and uh, yeah, and this way uh, it uh, contributed hugely towards the solving of this uh, PPE um, um, uh, issue. So that was uh, my uh, bit contribution and um, I hope Gustavo will uh, join us now to ask the next question and uh, I think Annika will be answering it. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. All right, that's good. So, turn me off. Uh, actually, what to know from Annika, uh, what should be done first of all in, in order to help the miners to benefit uh, from blockchain? Uh, you need to make her a presenter. She should be Tony, coming yeah. out. You need to turn me off. <laughs> yes, she okay. is not a presenter. She can answer our question now. Okay. Annika, you'll need to turn on your camera. Okay, it's, it's working, it's working, it's happening. <laughs> we cannot hear you, Annika. Yeah, the mic, the mic is off. Here we go. Uh -huh. There we go. Um, oh, th yeah, thanks for the question. Um, so what needs to be done first? I mean, uh, you know, it's, it, I think it ties into to, to some of the concepts I was touching on in my presentation, right? And actually, you see this really nicely with a, uh, with um, lots of the people that, that have presented today, which is we need to make it usable. You know, we, we, we can't go in explaining blockchain to people. It's not it's not a concept that matters. Um, it enables you to solve problems in ways that previously weren't either possible to solve or couldn't be solved in the most optimal, cheapest, better, most 
um, optimal fastest, what have you way, right? So I think it's about explaining the business value or the solution to a need that the miner may have. Um, and, you know, speaking about the business value that you're able to provide and um, figuring out how to integrate that into their existing processes and the technology that they use. But I don't think you should almost even mention the word, word blockchain necessarily. Um, you should talk about the value that it brings. Um, and then, of course, later on, as they start to understand, they see value, they want to learn about it. And so being able to provide them the resources to learn more, to understand what problems it fits with best so that they can then come back to you and say, actually, maybe these are the areas that it works. And then you'll really start to understand the value that it can provide in the industry once the industry itself starts to innovate rather than people externally coming in. All right. Thank you. Um, the next question actually goes to Tony. Um, and it's a bit related to also what uh, Hugh was uh, uh, talking before in terms of an implementation uh, of the technology right before uh, when we had this new wave of SAP coming and uh, making sure that we didn't have any duplicates uh, of files. Uh, so, so for Tony, uh, what are the biggest challenges for the implementation of this technology nowadays, uh, based on your experience? So, I, I mean, and, and uh, by the way, I'm not a blockchain expert, but if you think about, you know, the whole gamut of new digital technologies, including analytics and digital twins and drones and whatever it is, um, you know, what we generally see is it's absolutely not about the technology. It's about the organizational alignment that you need to have in place for people to use the technologies in their day-to-day -day operations. So it's about people, process, and organizational change. And we've learned that the very, very hard way over the last 15 years in oil and gas. And the depressing thing I would say is where we thought when we first put our first visions for this together in oil and gas in 2003 and four, where we thought we would be in 2010, we're still not there more than 10 years later. I would say so that you just cannot overestimate the organizational resistance to this. Um, so, so that's absolutely key. I do do agree that, you know, this is all these technologies have got to be about problem solving. They've got to be what is the real operational need in the field and, and how is it going to ch change? And I think when we look at when we do this and we try and convince people in the in the operations to to, to use net te te new technologies, we, we generally think about three things. One is the is the is the co quantifiable business case. So, how much money am I going to spend on doing this, and what am I going to save? And usually, that saving is in more productions or less cost, right? Mm -hmm. uh, at those two levers, occasionally more recovery, depending depending on your situation. But there are two other ways that we. You, uh, two other things I think you need to address if you want to convince people to to do this. One is what we call the qualitative business case. So that's explaining to a mining geologist or an engineer or a technician or a team leader in the field how this is going to improve his daily work life. Right. It's the ex explanation of the what's in it for me. And then the third thing is what we call the enabling business case. And what we mean by that is it what is it that you have to do tomorrow that you can't do today and you've got no choice right because more often than not if there if this is just an incremental improve uh, improvement if there's not a burning bridge it's very hard to get these things installed there's there's no doubt and we've got case after case after case of this uh of you know tens of millions of dollars euros being spent on it integration systems that have been jumped after two or three years in oil and gas there's no doubt about it. And I think there are some interesting lessons learned. Um, you know, one of the things BHP did in their IROC in Perth very early on is when they all they really did was co-locate all the people in that center. They didn't bring in any fancy IT or informational data systems at all. What they actually did was co-locate them and get them to work out what was the barriers to the processes in the processes which were stopping them working together and they would literally map it out on whiteboards with bits of paper and colored pens and it was only after they they nailed that process down which took them you know nearly two years that they then implemented an integrated data and information platform so so i i think 
um, you know, don't oversell this stuff is the other thing, you know, it, it, you know, because as operations guys will have half a dozen different initiatives coming at them all claiming to do the same sort of thing, you know? <laughs> yeah. Thank you for your answer. And uh, next question actually is related to, to what uh, Anika was saying before. Um, and it goes to who? Um, yeah, what kind of uh, companies should implement blockchain and are not doing it yet? Okay, so I'll, um, I'll answer that a little bit with um, an answer from the previous question as well, because the I, I actually I, I agree with everything you said, Tony, but it's it's also much worse than that when you're implementing. Uh, it depends what you're implementing, whether it's for one company or a group. But where where, where we're working with with MindHub, we're implementing this for the industry. So you've got you know what are you going to do and why? What's the value? What's the business case? But then you've got uh, the the internal politics. Okay, who's your sponsor? Who's going to sign off on it? Where's the budget coming from? Well, that's all very well for one company, but actually it's which company is going to get the value? Who is the sponsor in each company? Is the value unequal? Who's Who has to do what? For some people, it might actually be a negative, for others a positive. So how do you get that, that alignment um, uh, across all the different parties? So for for a lot of the work that I've done, the governance um, uh, is is very much the most important thing. And and if you look at some of the big blockchain projects where they've there's some that have worked really well at the start and publicly they're a great success, but then they've not I wouldn't say imploded, but they they've slowed down significantly over what they should have been because uh, you've got politics from the market coming into the boardroom and and, and all sorts of things like that. Um, or you've got unequal benefits across uh, different companies. So you need to get that alignment across the, the different users correct. Um, and it's the same as what you said around, you know, make sure the users um, are going to like it, it's going to change their lives, but then again, whose lives in which companies. Um, for me, the uh, for the second question, Gustavo, there, um, if, if, in terms of what kind of companies should be implementing blockchain, um, and, and which aren't at the moment. I think um, there's some things you can do internally, um, which are, uh, yeah, there's, there's different cases there. Um, I'm generally, personally, I haven't really looked at those as much, at least not for, for a long time. Um, where it's a group activity um, or a group benefit, anywhere where you have a market which is not high frequency, um, as much as the technology can do some of that, it's, it's, it's more of a push. It's harder on the technology side. Um, uh, but where there are a large number of parties that are ever changing, uh, coordinating around something. So that could be in a, you know, in a pharmaceutical supply chain or a, actually any, any world supply chain, uh, tends to have those, uh, th those things. If you have, um, if you look at interbank settlement, um, it's slightly different. You tend to have uh, a lot of bilateral between two parties or a third party as well. Um, so the the although you can solve a lot of solution, uh, a lot of the issues there, um, the problem becomes exponentially harder to deal with uh, when you can't just do direct integrations. So yeah, anyone uh, anyone in an industry with with that kind of supply chain or with even in telecoms where you've got lots of parties trading uh, for overseas data and things like that um, there's a lot of people a lot of departments a lot of companies involved in the settlement and processing after the fact after the trade has been agreed or signed or, or whatever it is um, those kind of companies should be looking at it um, in terms of which are not and should be now. Um, if you're in one of those industries and you're not right now, uh, chances are super high that several of your competition have already. Um, so I suppose don't get left behind on that. But um, yeah, it's the, the advantages um, need to be well defined um, uh, and for who's going to get which advantages before you can really deploy a, a project like that. Right. I mean, just to come back up to you on that, I mean, it's exactly what we see in, in oil and gas. I mean, in oil and gas, the problem isn't that we don't have 
data standards is that we have too many data standards and nobody will agree on the one that is going to become the universal data yeah. standard. And if you just take drilling as an example, I mean, you know, that data standard took 10 to 12 years to evolve to become an industry standard. And um, now we've got an industry standard for drilling data, but we don't have it for production data or subsurface data yet. Yeah. Uh, and, and in fact, um, you know, there were a number of the service companies who were trying to have a slightly different version of the standard so that they could lock you in or lock you out, if you see what I mean. So there was a huge amount of politics being played and it was extremely difficult to get it aligned. And I would say, you know, even 15, 20 years on, we're really not there, even with the, the easy one in our in our domain, which is drilling. And that's um, why the governance is, is so important. If you have um, if you have a central party, like we, we, we are signing up with our clients to certain rules in terms of how we operate, where basically they've got a, a loaded gun over us saying, well, if you break these rules, um, we can, and I, uh, I don't know legally yet exactly how it's being set up, but effectively we can rip out the management team and fix it. Um, now that's not something that most companies uh, traditionally do, but it, 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 it means that we can effectively prove that if we, you know, if we ever acted in a way where we're trying to create a standard that's going to lock everyone in rather than making it all open, um, uh, if we're trying to exclude certain parties or triple the fees or whatever it is on the, on the core platform, um, that gives them uh, control over that situation. Um, so we, we can never do that. And they, that that kind of issue has come up time and time again, where you've got a central you know, stock exchange assessment platform, whatever it is, that's been formed. And then the moment it's all signed and going, they triple the fees um, and they, you know, they, re they renegotiate everything. They, they are a monopoly. Um, so yeah, it becomes very difficult um, if you don't set that up right at the start. Yep. All right, great. Well, we uh, have run out of time and I want to be on time um, because people are very patiently still online, but uh, I want to make sure that I don't miss on the important part, which is saying thank you. So first of all, thank you to all our speakers uh, who supported me in, in this uh, initiative. It was the very first one uh, and it worked out, I think, pretty well, uh, especially great interest that uh, we've uh, received and fantastic quality of presentations. I'm sure they will be viewed on YouTube many times. Then, of course, thank you to Gustavo for joining me on this journey. I would not have felt uh, so confident. Uh, so thank you for your support. Mm -hmm. And I hope we will continue uh, to work and offer our services to the blockchain and mining community. Uh, I also want to thank um, my next conference, Arthur Polikov, uh, who uh, invited me several times to his uh, uh, conferences uh, to promote my blockchain mining idea. I'm very grateful for that. And it was actually from this conference that the idea of that conference was born from my presentation at the Minex conference in July. I want to thank Dr. Jane Thomason of FinTech, who supported me in my, um, how to say, ambition to run this conference. It was quite scary. And same Helen Disney. Uh, from Women in Blockchain Group. Um, she is running her own company called Unblock. Uh, support from uh, my uh, female colleagues is very much appreciated. It's uh, scary stuff starting something like that. And uh, finally, I want to support, uh, to thank my family and specifically my children who actually helped me sort out the software. Uh, my son wrote a music that you've heard in the beginning of the conference and also did a lot of the design. So very very grateful for all those people and uh, we'll be looking forward to seeing many of you again uh, end of october and have a great day thank, thank you. you bye bye um, are you thank able to leave sorry are you able to leave it open so we can finish the chats uh yeah i think so yes sure. um